Well, good morning, Cameron. Glad to be with you today. It is June 9th, uh, so happy Sunday. And uh, we have with us uh, two guest stars today, uh, James Box and Tom Selleck. I I'm sorry, Tom Thomas Box. Thomas Box is who that, who that actually, you may have been fooled for a moment, uh, but it's actually Thomas Box. All right, so uh, let us open this morning with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we give thanks to you for this opportunity to gather together and worship you, to fellowship with one another, to hold each other accountable in Christian love, and to encourage one another in our faith. Open our hearts and our minds to your word this morning. Speak to us by the power of your Holy Spirit. Guide us and instruct us that we might be joyful in our obedience and ever mindful of your laws and lessons. We pray this in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. So very good. Our first reading this morning is from 1 Samuel. So let me find that. And it is 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 4 through 20. Okay. Uh, then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. And said to him, look, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. Uh, but the thing displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. So Samuel prayed to the Lord and the Lord said to Samuel, heed the voice of the people in all that they say to you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me. That I should not reign over them according to all the works which they have done since the day I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day, with which they have forsaken me and served other gods. So they are doing to you also. Now, therefore, heed their voice. However, you shall solemnly forewarn them and show them the behavior of the king who will reign over them. So Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who asked him for a king. And they said, this will be the behavior of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for his own chariots and to be his horsemen. And some will run before his chariots. He will appoint captains over his thousands and captains over his fifties. Will set some to plow his ground and reap his harvest and some to make his weapons of war and, equip, uh, and equipment for his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers, cooks, and bakers, and he will take the best of your fields, your vineyards, and your olive groves, and give them to his servants. He will take a tenth of your grain and your vintage and give it to his officers and servants, and he will take your male servants and your female servants, your finest young men and your donkeys, and put them to his work. He will take a tenth of your sheep, and you will be his servants." And you will cry out in that day because of your king whom you have chosen for yourselves and the Lord will not hear you in that day. Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel and they said, no, but we will have a king over us that we may also be like the other nations and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. And Samuel heard all the words of the people and he repeated them in the hearing of the Lord. So the Lord said to Samuel, heed their voice and make them a king. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Very good. Okay. Our second reading for today is from 2 Corinthians 4, verse 13 to chapter 5, verse 1. So 2 Corinthians 4, 13 to 5, 1. Paul writes, and since we have the same spirit of faith according to what is written, I believed and therefore I spoke. We also believe and therefore speak, knowing that he who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus and will present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, that grace, having spread through the many, may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. 
while we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. For we know that if, that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have building from God a house, not made with hands, but eternal in the heavens. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Very good. Now, our gospel reading for today is from St. Mark chapter 3, verses 20 through 20, 35. Mark, St. Mark 3, 20 through 25. Sometimes my pages stick together. This happens on newer Bibles. As I've... Did you also get the larger print You don't need to tell everybody that I had to get a big print Bible. But yes, I did get a large print Bible. Um, let's go. Mark, uh, St. Mark chapter 3 uh, to verse 35. Then the multitude came together again so that they could not so much as eat bread. But when his own people heard about this, they went out to lay hold of him, for they said, he's out of his mind. And the scribes who came from Jerusalem said, he has Beelzebub, and by the ruler of demons he cast out demons. So he called them to himself and said to them in parables, how can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but has an end. No one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man, and then he will plunder his house. Assuredly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the sons of men, and whatever blasphemies they may utter. But he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is subject to eternal condemnation because they said he has an unclean spirit. And his brothers and his mother came, and standing outside, they sent to him, calling him, and a multitude was sitting around him. And they said to him, Look, your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. But he answered them, saying, Who is my mother or my brothers? And he looked around in a circle at those who sat about him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and mother, the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Right. Okay. So uh, today, wonderful stories. And we have this story from uh, 1 Samuel 8, uh, which is going to be, uh, you know, we've covered last week uh, uh, the, uh, the sort of call of Samuel. And Samuel worked for many, many years, um, and he was very diligent. And Samuel, as I've said before, I mean, he's kind of holding the entire nation together uh, in one way or another. I mean, Samuel is really uh, an amazing administrator and has kind of held Israel together for a very, through a very tumultuous time. Now, um, I want to talk about what he's doing here, which is the people come and they say, look, you're old. You're not going to be around forever. Your sons are not good. Strangely, uh, this was the same problem Eli had, his predecessor, his kind of mentor. His sons had problems. Uh, I think this serves as kind of a reinforcement to our clergy um, because, unfortunately, this is kind of, I mean, it's such a problem that it's a famous issue. We joke about PKs, preachers, kids. Um, you, you know, you can be so devoted to the work or so focused on the church that uh, your own family can sometimes uh, be, be a little neglected or you're not paying enough attention. And that's, that's not good. So, you know, it's a word of warning that, hey, uh, keep your kids where they need to be and pay enough attention, be, be an involved parent. But uh, really, this is the work. This is going to be the great work of Samuel's life. Samuel is going to anoint the first two kings of Israel and not just anoint, but kind of mentor them. So, I mean, you know, I don't think there's any question that as a piece of literature, um, as a cultural influence, 
the Holy Scriptures have been the bedrock of Western civilization since the early, early Middle Ages. You know, when about by about 350, you know, give or take, I mean, but when the church becomes the dominant culture of the Roman Empire, Christianity has been the dominant force behind Western civilization ever since. And that is evident, the story of the dynamic between Samuel and first Saul and then Samuel and David, they become the foundations for the stories of Merlin and Arthur, of Gandalf and Aragorn, of any time you've got the old mentor figure. Are you counting? Okay. Anytime you've got an old mentor figure and then the young king or young warrior or young, you know, uh, that's really kind, you can see the influence there of Samuel and, Sa and Saul or most notably Samuel and David. So those are key influences. Uh, Samuel is upset and he's upset on God's behalf because the people came and they said, give us a king. And Samuel is upset. Uh, he's like, you know, what are you doing? And the Lord says to Samuel, listen, you know, they're not really rejecting you, Samuel. They're rejecting me. And so we're going to let them have what they want. Uh, you warn them what's going to happen because you tell them what it's going to be like. And then when they don't like it one day, they go, oh, we don't like this. You you be like, no, that's what y'all asked for, and God's not going to hear your complaints anymore. It's going to be awful. Now, of course, people want to say, well, David was a good king. You know, Saul was a lousy king. David was a good king, though right at the end, it doesn't end great. And then Solomon, his son, is a mixed bag, up and down. After that, the, the kingdom is split to the northern half, which we kind of commonly call Israel, and the southern half we call Judah. And the north has just terrible kings, terrible. And the south uh, has a few good ones, but mostly bad. And that's why they get judged for these idolatrous, terrible kings, and they have to go to Babylon in exile. When they come back from Babylon, there's no more kings. I mean, the bloodline is still there. Obviously, they trace it. But uh, they, don't, they don't have monarchy anymore. The kings don't work well. And that's because the people, the people, the people's longing for a king was really an act of uh, faithlessness and uh, disobedience and also just not believing in God, just unbelief, just a distrust. Uh, God was supposed to be their king. And by wanting an earthly king instead, it's really a lack of faith in God. And they're going to pay the price. So uh, Samuel is going to enter into his life's real kind of ministry, which is or anointing and mentoring these kings and trying to keep them on roughly between the ditches uh, on the straight and narrow. Saul will fail ultimately. Uh, he has a lot of problems. David does pretty well as long as Samuel is still alive to guide him. Um, I think he looked at Samuel almost like kind of a second father figure. And when he listened. Samuel would speak and David would generally listen. But once Samuel died, David kind of wandered a little on his own. He was a little listless. So uh, we come to the gospel this morning. And, you know, the, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, they're always trying to trick Jesus. And they want to figure out how do I get rid of this guy. We probably, they probably want to kill him. So they've got to figure out how to do that. And they're always coming up with some trick. And so today they're going to say, well, look, 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 look. He's doing these miracles. He's doing these miracles. And uh, he's casting out demons by the power of a demon. So, you know, he's using witchcraft, basically. That's the accusation. And Jesus is saying, why would I cast out demons if I was powered by demons? Like, if I was on their team, why would I be casting them out? And Jesus says, how can Satan cast out Satan? 
If the kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. You know, um, so he's saying even the demons know you can't stab each other in the back. Even the demons know you take care of the people on your own team. Like that's, and, and so, you know, let's think about how many, how common betrayal is in human affairs. How, how many times in our eh, political system, people just throw each other under the bus. Jesus is saying, even the demons know better than that because that'll just kill the whole thing before very long. So, um, and if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. If Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but has an end. Huh? Uh, knowing who is on our team and not attacking each other is an important thing. Um, no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man and then he will plunder his house. Assuredly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven, the sons of men, and whatever blasphemies they may utter. But he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven, but is subject to eternal condemnation because they said he has an unclean spirit. Now I want to talk about this a moment. He says, whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit can never be forgiven. Now that's very serious, and it ought to cause us to pause and I, because we certainly wouldn't want to be guilty of that, would we? So, um, what does he mean? Well, he means basically when you see someone doing the work of God and you accuse them of doing evil, you are blaspheming against the Holy Spirit in this case. In this case. Uh, there have been many theologians and good preachers, Dr. Billy Graham in particular comes to mind, who have preached on this idea of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit and how to avoid it and what does it mean. John Wesley talked about it. And those are all important lessons and those are all, but, but this morning I really want to see, because I think this, this passage is specific. They saw Jesus performing miracles, healing people and doing for it. And so they said, well, he's, he's doing those things. He's casting out demons by the power of demons. And Jesus said, how can Satan stand against Satan? If he were to do that, Satan's kingdom would fail. Like that's just self-destructive. And Satan's too smart for that. Unfortunately, um, the church is not. And I want to talk today about how the church is often divided against itself between our different branches. And um, denominationalism has infested the church. And I don't think it is any way outlandish to say what is true. And that is our divisions are killing us. The church is dying in America. And much of that has to do with the infighting and how we lob these accusations of unfaithfulness at each other. Um, there is a hierarchy of truth, both in orthodoxy and in orthopraxis. And, but we Protestants are like, sometimes it's like trying to herd cats. I mean, it's, we're just kind of all over the place. And, uh, you know, I, I don't want to pick on anybody in particular, but there's a good old joke that I heard where uh, a Southern Baptist man was uh, marooned on a desert island. And he, he was there by himself for about 10 years. And so, you know, uh, when they finally found him, they rescued him, and then it was a big news story. So they brought him back to the island to film, and he could tell everybody the story. And so as they, you know, it was a large enough island and it had trees and things, and he had figured out how to make a life for himself. So he had erected several structures. And they said, uh, well, tell us about this first structure. And the man said, well, uh, that's my uh, kind of house. I mean, I sleep in there. Um, you know, I have a few shelves, cook, keep my stuff. Uh, that's kind of my, my living quarters. And they said, okay, what's this structure over here? And he goes, well, it's just got a roof, but that's my kitchen. 
Uh, you know, if it caught fire, I certainly didn't want my bed to get burned up. So my kitchen's separate. It's over here. They said, okay, that's good. What's this one over here? He goes, oh, well, that's the storehouse. I had uh, stored things and uh, tried to have a place to storage stuff, keep things organized. So I built that little shed. And they said, great. Uh, they said, what's this one over here? And he goes, well, he smiles. He says, that's, that's my church. He said, I built a church to praise the Lord and worship God. And I thank God every day that I survived this. And so I would, I kept the calendar on a tree over there. I'd make marks, count the days. And every seventh day I would go and, and uh, pray and, and uh, uh, had a little Gideon Bible. And they said, well, that is very nice. That's just inspiring. Thank you. Uh, tell us about this other building. And he goes, oh, well, that's the old church before the split. Now, <laughs> the boys won't really understand. Uh, you know, sometimes Protestants, Baptists in particular, are kind of famous for being the only Christians who can do addition by, by subtraction or do multiplication by division. Um, you know, we split our churches. The Methodists have gone through a split recently. And there are, I'm sure, valid reasons for splits sometimes. If it's a dogmatic issue, if there's a difference over serious uh, Christian teaching and, 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 and biblical teaching, orthodoxy and orthopraxis, those are legitimate questions. But um, just dividing ourselves and then making recriminating statements against other groups is not helpful. Uh, a house divided cannot stand. Now, uh, I am not, for example, a member of the Catholic Church, though I have tremendous respect. I've talked about my mentor and friend, Father Tim, and, and the Catholic Church has done a lot for me in my education, training, and Christian formation, but I'm not a Catholic. However, whatever differences I may have uh, with the Catholic Church, the amount of good that they do is tremendous. The amount of history and theology and what the charitable work they do to help people is unbelievable. So even though I don't, uh, I'm not a part of the Catholic Church, I certainly don't want to be talking out of turn and be disrespectful. Now, uh, likewise, I give the Presbyterians a bit of a hard time. That's old Wesleyanism versus Calvinism. Uh, but push come shove. Uh, you know, all jokes aside, they are Christians. And, and yet, I'm not a Calvinist, and I wouldn't disagree with many of the Calvinist positions, but the amount of good they're doing as fellow Christians far outweighs the bad. And no one's forcing me to go to Presbyterian Church. So I should politely shut my mouth and focus on being the best Methodist I can be and not... Uh, make denigrating comments about other Christians. A house divided cannot stand. And if it's so obvious that even Satan and the demons, the agents of chaos, know that you got to stick up for your team or the whole thing will fall apart, then brothers and sisters, love your fellow Christians do what you believe is right, but don't be too harsh or critical about our brothers and sisters. We're all God's children, and we're all on Team Jesus. And the Holy Spirit is active in those. It, look, if they support the Bible, if they do the creeds, if they are upholding orthodoxy and orthopractice and teaching Christianity, then the Holy Spirit is in there somewhere, even in ways I don't necessarily understand sometimes. Now, I'll, I'll close with this story, and I, I think this is kind of to the point. Uh, years ago, years ago, back in Aberdeen, my mother, uh, who was, you know, a, a great uh, in-college speech and theater major, and she used to run the community theater there in Aberdeen uh, for like 25 years. I mean, maybe longer. And they put on two plays a year, one at, at uh, Christmas time and one for the annual town festival, what we call the pilgrimage. And uh, there was a Pentecostal lady who um, had been in my mother's play. And the Pentecostal church is a large church. Uh, and they're a little different. They're oneness Pentecostal, so non-Trinitarian. So we, you know, 
without passing judgment, just different. And they have different beliefs. And their worship style is different. And I have several very good friends who were members of that church. Uh, two friends in particular, uh, Rachel and Lorenda Eves, were two young ladies who I went to high school with. Wonderful, very good friends of mine. Wonderful people. We went to college together at Ole Miss. And they belong to that church. So, you know, nice people. And that church does a lot of good in our community, but different beliefs. Um, but we, I was home from college, and uh, we, I was with my mother. We went to the grocery store, which we used to call the Jitney Jungle. Uh, and we ran into this lady. And she came up uh, to speak to my mother. And I don't recall the lady's name. Probably not important for this story. But she said, oh, hello, Kathy, it's nice to see you. And my mother said, oh, hello, and hugged her, and, you know. And she said, this is my son, Oliver. He's at Ole Miss, and I shook the lady's hand. And uh, she said, well, Kathy, I wanted to invite you to, you and your family, to come to church with us at the Pentecostal church. And my mother, uh, very politely, said, thank you so much for that invitation. Uh, we are members at the First Methodist Church, and we're, we're, we've been going there for a long time. Jim's family's been there a long time. And I sing in the choir, and Jim's an usher, and uh, we're very involved. So, you know, we pr I appreciate that, but we're, we're very happy at the Methodist Church. And then the lady said, well, Kathy, I'm concerned because you don't have the Holy Spirit at the Methodist Church. My mother, the steel magnolia, she sort of pursed her lips and she said, well, I can assure you we most certainly do have the Holy Spirit at the Methodist Church. He's just kind enough to mind his manners when he's at the Methodist Church. And we, <laughs> we promptly walked away. Um, I'll never forget that. Um, because my mother was saying, you know, basically, we don't know what God is doing over there at y'all's church. Uh, given the fact that they do not believe in the Holy Trinity, I, I feel led and called to pray for them. Uh, because I know they're doing their best. They're trying to love Jesus as best they can. And in many ways, they do a wonderful job of living their faith. But without being Trinitarian, it certainly raises some concerns as a traditional and orthodox Christian. Um, but to be accused that the Holy Spirit is not in our church is to fail to recognize the work of the Holy Spirit, if, even if he's working differently. Sometimes in very charismatic churches, you'll see people waving their hands or dancing or speaking in tongues or manifesting different gifts. It is not my place to say whether or not that is the work of the Holy Spirit. It's not my place to question that. What I'm to do, I think Jesus tells us clearly, is how will I know a true Christian? By their fruits. Do they keep the commandments? Do they do the charitable works of God? Do their life exhibit the fruits of the Spirit? Do they do the works of Jesus Christ? If I see those gifts, then who am I to question the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit blows where he will, and he may act in certain communities and in certain people's lives differently than he's manifested to me. The question is, is he leading us to Jesus? Is he speaking the words of Christ into my heart and guiding me to be more like Jesus? Whether that involves a very charismatic, spirit-filled expression, whether that's a very liturgical, ritualistic expression, or anything in between. If God is using the Spirit and the Spirit is making them into Christians, then how the Spirit chooses to operate, even when it's different from the way I'm dealing with Him, I have no right to question the Spirit because we're all on Team Jesus. And we better remember that going forward because there's fewer and fewer Christians out there in America every year. Better put down these defenses. Better put down these recriminations. Better stop 
dismissing other groups because they don't do it like we do it. You love the Lord and let other people love the Lord as they are called to love him. In the end, you'll know if it's legitimate by their fruits, right? All right. We love you. God loves you. Let the Holy Spirit work in you to make us more like Christ. Love one another. We'll see you next week. Bye. Bye.